And we're pleased to have another corporate sponsor. This is uh, Tom Flynn from uh, Babcock and Wilcox. And uh, this is actually a nice follow-up to some work that um, uh, Tyler Dare and Jackie O'Connor did with uh, Tom and Susanna Ruffner uh, a couple years ago on their package boiler. I showed a brief example of that in the introduction yesterday. And uh, Tom's going to show some follow-up of uh, signal processing and uh, a lot more detail than we normally get from a corporate sponsor. So I'm looking forward to this. So, Tom. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the center for inviting us to present this work. I'd also like to commend the team who's putting this hybrid session on. It's really difficult to pull this off, and I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, I want to recognize my co-authors on this paper, Susanna Rufner, who's actually the lead author, and Tim Fuller, who's worked with me for many years on uh, thermoacoustic and uh, issues and combustion instability issues with uh, Babcock and Wilcox equipment. Uh, short introduction to Babcock and Wilcox. We are a provider of equipment to the power industry and uh, industry in general. Our business lines are divided into three groups. We have a um, Technology and Renewable Energies Group. Uh, this is mostly associated with uh, biomass combustion, um, energy, long-term energy storage. We also have some work in process recovery boilers in the paper industry. And um, this is a growing segment of our business, as you could imagine, as renewables take more of a prominent role in a decarbonized society. The next group is our clean environment group. This is mostly post-combustion control of emissions. Uh, we sell uh, sulfur dioxide scrubbers. We also now sell carbon dioxide scrubbers. But all types of emission control are done out of this group as well as the handling and recovery of the ash or solid waste. The last group is actually the original group of the company. This is the thermal group. This is the group that designs large uh, um, utility and industrial boilers to produce steam, either for process heat or steam that is sent to a uh, steam turbine for electricity generation. Could you advance the slide? Um, just a word on a, a major change within our company. As decarbonization has grown in interest worldwide, we've kind of branded or collected a group of our technologies that were actually, um, we started developing in the late 1990s, early 2000s. It's amazing, we talk about generating these and developing these at the turn of the century. I would have never thought I'd be talking about that in an engineering conference. But um, the technologies are chemical looping, which is basically flameless combustion. We use an iron oxide to uh, react with the fuel in a reducer, which is much like what happens in a steel mill. The metal oxide is reduced by the fuel, and we have the option of exposing that reduced metal oxide to steam and produce hydrogen, which is very attractive in the hydrogen economy that's growing. The metal oxide then is regenerated in a combustor. This is an exothermic reaction, so the metal oxide is reoxidized and it's also heated to provide the heat necessary for the endothermic reduction reaction. This process is uh, inherently separates the carbon dioxide from the rest of the flue gas in kind of a sequestrable uh, form. So inherently, this is one of the more visionary um, leading technologies, long-term technologies that uh, we've been developing. Uh, technology starting back in um, the late 90s is the technology associated with oxycombustion. In this technology, what we do is we substitute pure oxygen for the air that's usually used in combustion of, of fossil fuel. 
The result is a CO2 rich gas again, and then this CO2 rich gas can be compressed and sequestered, or it can be used for enhanced oil recovery or something like that. The next technology is called um, SolveBright. This is a amine based solvent scrubbing of CO2. This is a post combustion process. So this is really good if you have a plant and you wanna to try to control the CO2 emissions from that plant. And then, as I mentioned, hydrogen combustion is really gaining um, popularity. And the reason for that is if you could generate the hydrogen at a large petrochem plant, or they call them hubs, and you can pipe that hydrogen to a power plant, B&W has the technology to switch natural gas or oil to hydrogen. Therefore, that plant doesn't emit any CO2. The only products of, of the combustion is water. So moving on to really the subject of the talk, and that is um, acoustics and vibration and issues that we face within equipment that we have. I'm gonna talk about, as um, Steve indicated, some work that we've done with Penn State and they've been instrumental in helping us with um, some of the problems that we have. One um, category is waste to energy air preheaters, uh, acoustics and vibration associated with um, the preheaters. As far as we know or can tell, it's not uh, caused by typical vortex shedding. We're trying to understand this better and it's an area of development need. Another possible uh, problem is thermoacoustic uh, vibration that uh, occurs due to changes in the combustion characteristics. This is one example where we know what to do to avoid it, but the problem is that as technologies are pushed to reduce um, nitrogen oxide emissions and carbon monoxide emissions, what happens is you encroach on a due to deep staging, a combustion instability. And at that combustion instability, I'm gonna point this out in more detail, you have uh, pulsing of the flame. This is low frequency, high power pulsing. They call it furnace rumble. And if you're standing by a furnace that is experiencing this, your chest actually vibrates due to the severity of the rumble. And it, it's actually quite scary because it almost seems like the boiler's gonna break itself apart. We also have uh, instances where we get some uh, pulsation between the generating bank, the generating bank is where uh, water is heated, to, uh, excuse me, the generating bank is where the steam is generated, and then the economizer bank, which in uh, carbon monoxide boilers. And these two sets of steam generating surfaces can experience vibration. Could you advance the slide? Thank you. So this is a picture of a, um, what we call a FM boiler. It's, it's factory manufactured. That is, this whole boiler is assembled in a factory and shipped to the site in its entirety. Let me just point out where the um, uh, vibration and acoustic issues are, and then we'll go into the data and the work that we did with um, Penn State. Once, sorry. One source of um, vibration is in the ductwork leading to the, this, this is called the wind box where the burner is. And we can get vibration due to fans or the ducting, especially as we try to make the ducting lighter and lighter, it can vibrate. This is um, what was shown with boundary layer shedding and things like that. Um, the thermoacoustic vibration is really emanates from the burner itself. What happens is as you stage the burner deeper and deeper, you get recirculation patterns from the combustion cavity back to the root of the flame. And these recirculation patterns are oxygen starved. They're combustible material. And as that, the combustible material recirculates back to the root of the flame, you can get lift off of the flame because there's an extinction event because there's not enough oxygen to keep the flame attached and combusted. 
At the back end of the boiler, much like uh, what many of you are familiar with, we have all the generating surface and we can have vortex shedding and vibration due to that. Okay, so the work that we did with Penn State was on a commercial FM boiler. We have a fan, an air duct, wind box, the burner, the furnace combustion cavity, the generating bank, just like I described, and then the boiler outlet, which goes to the stack. We have microphones at different points in the system, and um, what we did was we ran tests and to actually um, produce the furnace rumble. And then we would modify operating conditions, and it was primarily fi firing rate where we could eliminate the furnace rumble. So we have data for conditions where the furnace rumble occurs and where it's absent. The information that I'm gonna show in the data is uh, acoustic mic microphone information data, and, but we also had accelerometers, uh, piezoelectric accelerometers and different uh, dynamic pressure transducers. All of these are designed with frequency responses uh, satisfying the Nyquist criteria for sampling and to avoid aliasing. So um, the data that was collected, and this was work done by Tyler Dare and our, our technicians in the field, demonstrated a um, a low vibration frequency of about nine hertz. And um, this is what I was referring to. This is, this at low frequency, you get a lot of power and that's what causes the unit to vibrate um, potentially catastrophically, but very severely. Now what Penn State did in the analysis of this data and all this microphone data, they were able to identify potential fixes which included either the installation of a Helmholtz resonator or maybe some uh, stack dampers or other type of damping of the vibration. Of course, installing a, a Helmholtz resonator on a large boiler isn't a very easy thing to do compared to what you can do in smaller units or uh, components. So we took the approach of installing a, a stack damper and that was able to suppress the vibration. Now, um, we were able to deal with the vibration problem, but the real problem is, and this is the subject of future work, is predicting this ahead of time, not waiting for it to occur at the plant. So this is the development need, because these, um, as I mentioned, the contributors to vibration and even thermoacoustic um, vibration in packaged boilers is very complicated. There can be super uh, position of multiple modes of vibration. You have rotating equipment, flow control dampers. So there's a lot of different sources and trying to sort this out in the design phase is a very difficult task. So this is some data that um, Tyler uh, published in, um, in um, InterNoise conference in 2018. It's clear that you can see in the case with pulsations, the nine hertz and then the harmonics of the nine hertz greatly ex exaggerated versus a no pulsation mode. Um, coupled with the work that we did at Penn State, we also um, did some work with Oak Ridge National Lab. We've had a long, go, uh, long running collaboration with uh, Charles Finney and Stuart Daw down at Oak Ridge Lab. The work that we've done with them on both combustion stability and for fluidized bed fluidization quality assessment are based on theories of advanced nonlinear signal analysis and chaos theory. So these are the analysis techniques that we used um, to apply to the time series data. And I'm gonna describe each of these. Some of them are familiar to you, like the power spectrum and things like that, or even just looking at time series. But some of them may be new and maybe something that you'd be interested in applying yourselves. 
Okay, so this is the time series data and the condition where the uh, um, signal became uh, calm or quiescent is where we didn't have a furnace rumble problem. So the furnace rumble occurred at sections A and C. It was also very reproducible. And you can see artifacts of this, and it becomes obvious when you're looking at this, but you need a way of quantifying it online. And that's what the subject of future work is gonna do, is uh, look at this and be able to not only determine when it's happening, but predict when it might be happening. So let's take two tests, this test 17 and 18. If you look at um, test 17, I want to point out some features. Generally, you can see in the A and C data, there's a certain periodicity to the signal. You could see that with, without um, analyzing it. It's visually um, there. And that's what I was referring to before, where you have extinction ignition events occurring at the burner. The reason that this happens is a, a burner flame can get to um, a bifurcation point where there are two stable operating modes. There's an attached mode and a detached mode. Actually, we've observed cases where the flame could be detached four or five feet from the um, burner itself and remain stable at that condition, not flame out. However, that condition corresponds to a higher emissions condition, poor NOx, poor CO, poor combustion in general. We get a more uh, well-behaved burner and better performance when the flame is attached. But it can oscillate between these two stable states, and that's what causes this periodicity in the signal. A stable flame is one that has a, more or less a Gaussian distribution. This is interesting because this same phenomena applies to fluidized beds. A very well fluidized bed dis, dis, um, displays a Gaussian distribution of high speed pressure signals. When the fluidized bed starts to get coarse due to agglomeration or other accumulation of coarse material, the bed becomes um, more periodic in its pressure fluctuations. And this is because, in effect, the size of the bed material is getting coarser and coarser. And you can imagine lifting and dropping, lifting and dropping these very heavy particles. An interesting techno um, analysis technique out of chaos theory is what's known as temporal irreversibility. And basically what we do is we analyze the signal in the forward direction and the reverse direction with some algorithms. Interestingly enough, for a well-behaved flame and a, basically a flame with a Gaussian distribution, there's no temporal irreversibility. When you look at the signal forward and back, it looks the same. However, instances where you may have liftoff or instability show different characteristics, maybe a slow rise with a sudden drop. This could be a case where the flame is gradually detaching and then it might snap back due to a change in operating condition or load, or maybe a change in those recirculation gases. So we see this all the time in different processes. The other advantage of this is it gives you an insight that the process is highly nonlinear. And so it lends itself to other um, analysis techniques and diagnostics. So these are um, scans or these are um, traces of temporal reversibility during the different modes. As you remember, uh, mode A and C was where it, we had furnace rumble and the stable flame is in mode B. And each of these sensors, like number two is at the back of the back wall of the furnace, number four 
and three are associated with the fan and the inlet duct, and number one is like in the exit duct. Each of these have different characteristics, but from these characteristics, we can infer and relate them to actual physical events in the process. There's um, also, as you may be aware, uh, you can take cross-correlation and compare two signals to determine where the propagation of events is occurring and where an event might originate and then propagate in different directions. Generally speaking, the conclusion of this uh, work is that we saw that events were propagating from the fan to the back, to the back pass of the unit. This hasn't always been true. We've seen examples where there's um, thermoacoustic vibration issues and instabilities in the furnace, and that has actually propagated back into the inlet duct or even into um, the fan to cause instabilities on those components. That um, being able to tell with this information, what's the precursor and what uh, follows is very important to determine what the root cause of the vibration is. There's a nonlinear equivalent based on chaos theory, based, uh, really driven from information theory, which is called mutual information, or in this case, we use what we call bifunctional mutual information. Mutual information by itself is like autocorrelation, comparing a signal to itself, shifted in time by lags to see if there's any connection to what's happening at that point or with that sensor. Bifunctional mutual information takes two signals and compares them to each other, lagging the signals with respect to each other. When you have situations where there's a positive, a positive lag, as in this top um, figure, then you know that um, an event, like in this case downstream, was um, preceded by a, an event upstream, that positive lag. If it's negative, then what that means is an event downstream actually is causing an, uh, a disturbance upstream. In general, with um, the work that we did with Penn State, the propagation of events is from the, the fan to the back pass, pretty well behaved in that sense. So um, the conclusions from our analysis work with um, Penn State and Oak Ridge National Lab is vibration in industrial boilers is complicated. Lots of opportunities for additional research. Um, it remains difficult to predict during the design phase. What we know when it's happening because the customer tells us it's happening once the unit is built, but we need to be able to predict it. Um, and there's clear differences and quantifiable differences between the waveforms uh, between a rumble condition and a normal condition. This is good. If we have metrics and analysis techniques that can be used to diagnose when these things are happening, we can embed them in the control system and actually see when these things might be happening and identify precursors. Um, and as I said, you know, identifying these events spatially is really important. So uh, an opportunity for Penn State to work with us going forward is we are currently working with the Department of Energy on employing uh, what they call their uh, uh, design of advanced energy systems, IDEA software. And we're developing a model for a uh, FM boiler Uh, a process model coupling the combustion side to the steam side. And with this model and the idea of software, we have the possibility of incorporating um, equations and maybe closed form or maybe even sub-models, lower order models of vibration that can be used to detect when we might be on the onset of vibration. So, um, what we're really looking for is an opportunity to look at applications, not only for um, 
like condition assessment and uh, performance, but also things such as vibration and embed these into the system to determine root cause. And um, um, this can be very valuable for our customers because they may be able to adjust the operation of their unit to avoid these problems. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, that was enlightening. A lot of good stuff there. Um, time for a question or two before the break. Yeah, well, well, nice presentation. Uh, as you transition into uh, your hydrogen fuels, are, are you anticipating similar conditions in the boiler, or is, are you going to enter a new domain? Yes. Um, there's the um, information or the inquiries we're getting from our customers range from maybe just co-firing hydrogen with natural gas because there's some discussion nationally about blending in hydrogen with natural gas and there's limits on how much hydrogen can be blended with the natural gas to um, uh, ensure people in their homes can still use their gas stoves and things like that. But the hydrogen will have an effect of stabilizing the combustion. So I'm thinking that this, this problem would become diminished. Um, we've already worked with um, either our own burners or burners that we work with other burner manufacturers and have burners that can stably combust hydrogen. So that technology is pretty well understood and the issues of instability tend to go away. As the fuel becomes worse and worse, like going from natural gas to oil to coal, the instabilities become much more pronounced because the fuel is more difficult to burn. So in general, I would think the problem would, or anticipate the problem would be less with hydrogen. Okay, 